the whole stage that we think of as modern history goes right back up and the backdrop of that stage is the younger drivers. Hopefully I'm going to be around for a long time yet because it's so damn interesting and I'm so damn curious about the answers to these questions. The archaeologists and the prehistorians, people are looking at that, have failed to take into account the severity of these events we're talking about. You don't realize the extent of the total remodeling of this planetary surface that took place. Because the question always is, where are the artifacts? Where's the pottery? Where is the, the evidence that this civilization existed? Randall Carlson's theory about advanced ancient civilizations is truly fascinating and a bit of a departure from what we usually hear in mainstream archaeology. He's suggesting that highly sophisticated societies might have existed tens of thousands of years ago, way before the traditional cradles of civilization like Mesopotamia, Egypt, the Indus Valley and China came into the picture. Imagine civilizations thriving before or even during the last ice age, which wrapped up around 11,700 years ago. That idea alone pushes back the conventional timeline of human development by several thousand years. Now, when you look at the evidence Carlson brings to the table, it's primarily centered around those massive and mystifying megalithic structures scattered across the globe. Take the pyramids of Giza, for example. Their alignment with the stars of Orion's belt and the precision of their construction is just mind-blowing. Or Stonehenge with its solstitial alignment standing there on the Salisbury Plain. Two of these shafts um, go all the way through the body of the pyramid and exit on the outside and, and actually point at particularly significant stars. These structures suggest that the people who built them had a far more advanced understanding of astronomy than we usually give them credit for. Carlson dives into the engineering and architectural skills of these ancient builders. He talks about how they constructed these massive stone structures, some involving stones weighing several tons. Just think about the logistics of transporting and precisely placing these enormous stones over great distances. It indicates a level of engineering know-how and physical physics that seems way ahead of their time. Now moving on. Randall Carlson's theory about ancient civilizations is absolutely something different, isn't it? He really makes you think about the roots of our history in a new way. Just consider the megalithic structures scattered all over the world. When you account for the rise of sea level and the, the isostatic subsidence of the sea floor, it's not at all implausible that you had a large island complex in the mid-Atlantic Ocean. Carlson sees these as evidence of advanced prehistoric civilizations. The Great Pyramid of Giza, for example, is made up of over two million stone blocks, each weighing tons, and they're all placed with incredible precision. It's not just about the sheer size, but the sophistication in their construction. And it's not just in one place. These megalithic structures are everywhere, from the stone circles in Europe to the pyramids in Egypt and Mesoamerica. Carlson points out that the similarities in construction techniques and astronomical alignments across different cultures hint at a possibly shared or globally distributed source of knowledge. It's like these ancient builders were all tapping into the same advanced understanding, which is pretty mind-blowing to think about. Now, where it gets even more intriguing, is how Carlson links the disappearance of this advanced knowledge to catastrophic events. He often refers to the younger Dryas impact hypothesis, suggesting that a comet impact might have triggered drastic climatic changes at the end of the Ice Age. You may have periods of time where you have multiple impacts occurring over a short period of time associated with the destruction and disintegration of large comets. Imagine massive flooding, climate shifts, and entire civilizations collapsing. It's like something out of a movie, but Carlson suggests it could be what wiped out these advanced societies and their knowledge. But here's the thing. He thinks this lost knowledge didn't just vanish. According to Carlson, it lived on in myths, legends, and religious texts, which he sees not just as stories, but as historical records. Take the flood myths, for example, like Noah's Ark or the Epic of Gilgamesh. Carlson sees these as allegorical references to actual historical events, like massive post-glacial flooding. He believes that remnants of knowledge from these advanced civilizations were passed down through generations albeit in a fragmented and symbolically encoded way. Moving back to megalithic structures, Randall Carlson's work on the astronomical alignments of megalithic structures 
is like peeling back layers of history to reveal the deep astronomical knowledge of ancient civilizations. Take the megalithic temples of Malta, Hagar Kim and Manadra, for instance. These structures aren't just old, they're among the oldest freestanding structures in the world, dating back to around 3600, 3200 BC. What's really remarkable about them is how they demonstrate an intricate understanding of celestial movements, particularly the solar cycle. When you look at these temples, especially during the equinoxes, it's like watching a celestial dance choreographed by ancient architects. At Menajdra on the equinoxes, the sunlight filters through a specific aperture, illuminating an inner stone slab. It's this incredible precision that highlights how the builders weren't just stacking stones, they were aligning them with celestial events, marking the change of seasons with architectural precision. But it's not just about alignments. The architectural design itself is a marvel. Some reference to such an event can be traced in many of the legends and myths surrounding these stars that have come down to us from nations far removed from each other. The layout of the temples seems carefully planned to align with the sun's position at significant times of the year. For example, the main axis of Hagar Chim is almost perfectly oriented to where the sun rises during the solstices. It shows a level of planning and understanding of the sun's movements. And then there's the construction itself. We're talking about huge megaliths, each weighing several tons, placed with such accuracy that they align with celestial events. It wasn't just a matter of brute force. It required sophisticated knowledge of astronomy and construction techniques. Plus, they used local limestone, which is abundant in Malta. The complexity of these temples goes beyond just their size or the weight of the stones. They have multiple apses, altars and intricate carvings, all forming part of a complex architectural design. The series of semicircular chambers connected by a central corridor and their alignment with specific astronomical events. The pyramids of Giza, especially the Great Pyramid, the precision with which these pyramids align to the cardinal points of the compass is just mind-boggling. Think about it. The Great Pyramid, built for Pharaoh Khufu around 2580-2560 BC, is aligned almost perfectly north, south, east and west. The northern side aligns to within a fraction of a degree of true north. Considering the era it was built in, that's an incredible feat of geometry and astronomy. The construction techniques themselves are a mystery. The ancient Egyptians might have used stars or the sun's path to find true north, which implies they had advanced surveying techniques and a deep understanding of angles and straight lines. It's impressive when you consider the tools and technology available at the time. Then there's the fascinating Orion correlation theory. This theory suggests that the layout of the three main pyramids at Giza mirrors the stars in Orion's belt. Proponents like Robert Beauval believe this alignment was intentional, reflecting a belief in the connection between the heavens and the afterlife. They speak of these two regions of the sky, the southern sky with the stars of Orion, and there's a new one slide up. Here's a nice view of them. They're pristine, by the way. It's really eerie how they carve those texts by hand, and some of the details is extraordinary. With Orion associated with Osiris, the god of rebirth and the afterlife, the pyramids in this view were not just tombs, but also celestial maps and gateways for the pharaoh's soul to the afterlife. The smallest pyramid, Menkaure's pyramid, is slightly offset, mirroring the offset of the smallest star, Mintaka, in Orion's belt, which adds another layer of intrigue to this theory. The design of the pyramids also incorporates alignments with the sun and specific stars and constellations. For example, certain shafts within the Great Pyramid align with particular stars. These could have been more than architectural features. They might have held spiritual significance, possibly serving as pathways for the pharaoh's soul to the stars. Also, on specific days of the year, the sun sets between the pyramids, creating a visual spectacle likely significant in ancient Egyptian ceremonies. Now one of the most known megalithic structures. Would it be fair to say that there's an element of a rediscovery of a yes. lost technology from the past? I think it would be fair to say that, yes. Stonehenge, out there on the Salisbury Plain in Wiltshire, England. What's particularly fascinating about Stonehenge is its astronomical alignment and how it was constructed. The way it lines up with the summer solstice is probably what it's most famous for. On the longest day of the year, the sun rises right over the heel stone, which is set just outside the main stone circle. 
As the sun comes up, its rays shoot straight through the entrance and light up the center of the circle. Stonehenge also aligns with the winter solstice and possibly other celestial events. During the winter solstice, the sunset is framed by those massive stone trilithons, and some experts think it might even line up with lunar phenomena, which just adds another layer to how the builders understood both the sun and the moon's movements. When you think about how Stonehenge was built, it's even more mind-blowing. The final form was completed around 2500 BC, but it was built in phases over about 1,500 years. The main part of the monument is made up of these huge sarsen stones arranged in a circle, and there are smaller blue stones that were brought over from Wales. That's over 150 miles away. And then there's the layout of the stones. They're set up in this specific geometric pattern with an outer circle, an inner horseshoe arrangement, and those trilithon structures. The precision in the layout and how the stones are oriented show a really deep understanding of geometry and astronomy. It's not just a bunch of rocks placed randomly. Everything at Stonehenge is set up with purpose and meaning, which makes you wonder a little bit, doesn't it? They had a tradition that at that time, the world had been previously destroyed. And they dreaded lest a similar catastrophe would, at the end of a cycle, annihilate the human race. It's features like this that are just unequivocal in terms of realizing that this really happened. Human sacrifices were offered while the entire population passed the night upon their knees awaiting their doom. These people imagined the world would end. The Younger Dryas period, named after the Dryas octopetala flower which thrived in cold conditions and became common in Europe during this time, presents a fascinating chapter in Earth's history. This period, spanning approximately from 12,800 to 11,500 years ago, marks a transition from the late Pleistocene to the early Holocene. It's characterized by a dramatic downturn in temperature, disrupting the gradual warming trend following the last glacial maximum the coldest phase of the last ice age. This abrupt shift led to a drop in temperatures estimated to be between two to six degrees Celsius in a relatively short time. When the world went cold again during the Younger Dryas, the water, the melt water flowing from the glaciers into the oceans declined if it didn't stop altogether. And then about 1300 years later, boom, it started up again and that gave us Meltwater Pulse 1B. The effects of the Younger Dryas were not just confined to the North Atlantic region, but were felt globally, with evidence of climatic changes found in Asia, South America, and even the Southern Hemisphere. The resulting cold and dry conditions had a significant impact on vegetation patterns, ecosystems, and human populations dependent on hunting and foraging. Adding to the intrigue of this period is the proposed comet impact hypothesis. This theory posits that a comet, or fragments of one, struck Earth or exploded in the atmosphere, potentially in multiple waves. The impact, likened to the energy release of several nuclear explosions, is thought to have triggered widespread wildfires, consuming vast areas of forests and grasslands. These fires likely contributed to the formation of the black mat layer, a carbon-rich deposit found at numerous younger, drier sites. Supporters of this hypothesis point to evidence such as microspherules and nanodiamonds, typically formed under high-impact conditions, and elevated levels of rare elements like iridium and platinum to bolster their claims. The reason it's black is because it's so loaded with soot, which suggests wildfires, perhaps on a global or at least a hemispheric scale, that preceded the tremendous flooding that followed in its wake. Charcoal and soot layers in geological records also align with this time frame, suggesting extensive burning. However, the hypothesis is not without its challenges and controversies. One major point of contention is the absence of a clear impact crater, typically expected from such an event. Proponents argue that the comet might have disintegrated in the atmosphere or struck an ice sheet, leaving no obvious crater. Additionally, critics propose alternative explanations for the climatic shift, such as changes in ocean circulation patterns or volcanic activity. The debate continues as the evidence for a comet impact, while compelling, is not universally accepted. 
The Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, which suggests a comet impact around 12,800 years ago, is a topic that really captures the imagination with its blend of geological mysteries and climatic upheaval. At the heart of this hypothesis is an array of geological evidence. For instance, nano-diamonds, these tiny diamonds formed under extreme pressure, have been found across North America, Europe and parts of Asia in sediment layers dating back to the Younger Dryas period. Their presence in such widespread locations hints at a high-energy event on a global scale. Similarly intriguing are microspherules, small spherical particles often linked to extraterrestrial impacts or volcanic eruptions. The high concentrations of these particles found in the younger Dryas boundary layers further point to a large impact event, but there's more. We see other materials like elevated levels of iridium, rare on Earth but common in meteorites, and magnetic grains containing iridium. Plus, the discovery of soot and carbon-rich layers in these same sediments suggests widespread burning, likely due to wildfires ignited by the impact. Now, these shock-synthesized hexagonal diamonds only occur. They, there's no natural, known natural process that will produce them except for the intense heat and pressures of a cosmic impact. Evidence of impact material and the extinction of the megafauna 12,900 years ago. The impact material contains iron oxide spherules in a glassy iron silica matrix, which is one indicator of a possible meteorite impact. Then there are the Carolina Bays, these elliptical depressions along the U.S. Atlantic seaboard. Their origin is hotly debated, but some researchers think they might be craters from secondary impacts of comet fragments, aligning in a pattern that could suggest a comet coming from the northwest. The climatic impact of this proposed event is just as dramatic. Imagine a comet impact throwing massive amounts of dust, soot and particulate matter into the atmosphere. This debris spreading globally would have blocked sunlight, leading to a sudden drop in temperatures. This is exactly what we see when we look at climate models and ice core data from Greenland and Antarctica, which show a sharp temperature decline coinciding with the time of the proposed impact. The cooling effect was particularly strong in the Northern Hemisphere, with temperature drops estimated between 3 to 11 degrees Celsius in some regions. And if that wasn't enough, the comet impact could have also disrupted major ocean currents, like the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, leading to even further cooling, especially in the North Atlantic. During the transition from the Pleistocene epoch to the Holocene, which roughly overlaps with the Younger Dryas period, Something dramatic happened in North America, the extinction of numerous large mammal species. This included some iconic megafauna like woolly mammoths, mastodons, saber-toothed cats, giant ground sloths, and even the North American camel and horse. These extinctions weren't evenly spread across regions, with North America being particularly hard hit. Now, the intriguing part is the timing of these extinctions, which coincides with the Younger Dryas period. This has led proponents of the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis to suggest a connection between the comet impact and these mass extinctions. They argue that the comet impact would have triggered a cascade of ecological disruptions, including wildfires, climate change, and disruptions in the food chain. These sudden environmental changes might have outpaced the ability of these large species to adapt, ultimately leading to their demise. However, it's important to note that there are opposing views some scientists argue for alternative explanations, such as the overkill hypothesis, which suggests that human overhunting played a significant role in these extinctions. Others propose natural climatic changes independent of any impact event as potential drivers. Now, in these events that terminated the Ice Age, roughly half the great megafaunal species on Earth died out very rapidly. All of a sudden, around 12,000 to 13,000 years ago, a huge number of fossil remains were introduced into the environment. And so what, and then at the end of this, these species extinct, are extinct. They don't exist anymore. Like it says here, each square represents a fossil specimen of an extinct megafaunal species. So the debate continues and the impact hypothesis is just one of several competing theories. The Younger Dryas impact hypothesis doesn't stop at biological consequences. It also has implications for early human populations, particularly the Clovis culture. 
This culture, known for its distinctive stone tools, was widespread across North America during the same time frame as the younger Dryas. Researchers have noticed a connection between the apparent disappearance or transformation of the Clovis culture and the onset of the younger Dryas. This suggests that the proposed impact event might have significantly disrupted the way of life for these ancient people. The rapid shift to colder, drier conditions during the Younger Dryas would have undoubtedly affected the availability of food and resources for these hunter-gatherer populations. The changes in megafauna populations, which were a crucial resource for Clovis people, would have compounded these challenges. Archaeological evidence supports this idea of adaptation. There's a noticeable change in human tool technology and subsistence patterns after the Younger Dryas, reflecting a response to new environmental conditions and available resources. This period also marks the emergence of more regionally diverse cultures compared to the previously widespread Clovis technology. Carlson draws attention to rapid temperature changes in Earth's history, particularly emphasizing events like the Younger Dryas, a period marked by a sudden return to near-glacial conditions after a period of warming. His perspective challenges the conventional view of gradual climate shifts and instead suggests a dynamic and potentially unstable climate system. He points to historical precedents, such as the bolling alarod warming period before the Younger Dryas, where rapid shifts in climate are evident in paleoclimatic records. These events have been studied to understand the sensitivity and resilience of the Earth's climate system. One of Carlson's intriguing hypotheses is the idea that comet and asteroid impacts may have played a more significant role in Earth's history than currently recognized. He speculates that these impacts could have triggered ice ages or abrupt climatic shifts, potentially even contributing to mass extinctions. In the context of the Younger Dryas, Carlson and other proponents of the impact hypothesis argue that a cosmic impact event was a primary trigger for the abrupt climate change observed during this period. They point to geological and ice core evidence to support their claims. Ice core records, particularly from Greenland and Antarctica, offer detailed insights into past climates. Carlson highlights layers in these cores that correspond to rapid changes in temperature and atmospheric composition, which he interprets as evidence for catastrophic events. Other geological markers, like sediment layers rich in iridium or elements linked to extraterrestrial materials, further support the impact hypothesis. The presence of shock synthesized hexagonal and other nanometer sized diamonds in younger driest boundary sediments in association with soot and other wildfire indicators is consistent with a cosmic impact event of 12.9 kA. Randall Carlson's theory proposes the existence of advanced human civilizations that thrived long before the commonly accepted timeline of known history, potentially even preceding the last ice age, which ended roughly 11,700 years ago. This challenges the conventional view that attributes the emergence of civilization to much later periods, such as the Sumerian and ancient Egyptian civilizations that arose around 6,000 years ago. According to Carlson, these prehistoric societies weren't just technologically advanced, they also possessed profound spiritual understanding and wisdom. He speculates that their technological capabilities could have included advanced architecture, astronomy, and other sciences far surpassing what is typically associated with prehistoric cultures. To support his theory, Carlson points to the complexity and sophistication of ancient structures like the pyramids of Egypt, Stonehenge, and various megalithic sites worldwide. He argues that the precision in construction, astronomical alignments, and engineering skills evident in these structures suggest a higher level of knowledge and technological capability than mainstream archaeology typically acknowledges. Many of these ancient structures exhibit precise alignments with astronomical phenomena, such as solstices and equinoxes, which Carlson suggests is evidence of advanced astronomical knowledge. For instance, the layout of the Giza pyramid complex is aligned with the stars in the belt of the constellation Orion, while Stonehenge aligns with the solstices. One of Carlson's key ideas is that these advanced ancient civilizations might have met their downfall due to catastrophic events like comet impacts or other natural disasters. These disasters could have wiped out significant populations, leading to the loss of knowledge and technology. He also posits that remnants of this lost knowledge can be found in mythologies, religious texts, and ancient symbols across different cultures. According to Carlson, 
These ancient stories and symbols may contain allegorical references to real events and the lost advanced knowledge of these prehistoric civilizations. I think we're getting very close to rediscovering some of the things that um, our ancient ancestors were up to. And um, so through somehow, through this technology, they're able to move stones or cut stones or all the above? All the above. And, all the above. and even transport them? In the fascinating realm of Randall Carlson's sacred number theory, numbers transcend their basic arithmetic function, embodying deep cosmic and spiritual significance. This theory, interwoven with the principles of sacred geometry, posits that certain numbers and the geometric patterns they represent hold a universal, almost mystical quality, observable in nature, ancient architecture, and cosmology. A cornerstone of this theory is the examination of specific numbers that recur with astonishing frequency across various natural, architectural, and astronomical contexts. Take the number 108, for instance. In Hinduism, it's considered sacred, and in astronomy, it's intriguingly represented as the approximate distance ratio. The distance from the Earth to the Sun is about 108 times the Sun's diameter and the distance from the Earth to the Moon is roughly 108 times the Moon's diameter. This pattern appears too frequently to be mere coincidence, according to Carlson's theory, suggesting an underlying cosmic order. Carlson's theory further delves into the realm of sacred geometry, exploring how shapes like the flower of life, the Fibonacci spiral, and the golden ratio, approximately 1.618, are fundamental to understanding the structure of the universe. These patterns are found everywhere in nature, from the arrangement of leaves on a stem to the spirals of galaxies. The golden ratio, in particular, is seen in the proportions of the Parthenon in Greece and the Great Pyramid of Giza, indicating that ancient architects might have employed these as sacred proportions to mirror the harmony found in nature. In exploring ancient architectural marvels, Carlson points out how these structures were often aligned with astronomical phenomena. For example, the Great Pyramid of Giza aligns with the cardinal points of the compass, while Stonehenge aligns with the solstices. These alignments are not arbitrary but deliberate, indicating a sophisticated understanding of celestial movements. This knowledge, coupled with the use of sacred numbers in their design, suggests that these ancient structures were more than just physical edifices, they were constructed with a deep understanding of and connection to the cosmos. Moreover, Carlson's theory touches upon the idea that ancient civilizations might have encoded this knowledge of sacred numbers and geometry into their myths and religious texts. This idea proposes that stories and symbols from ancient texts are not just folklore or religious dogma, but are allegorical representations of profound scientific and astronomical knowledge. Venturing further into Randall Carlson's exploration of sacred numbers, we enter the realm of sacred geometry, a concept that suggests the universe itself is constructed on geometric principles. This intriguing notion posits that certain geometric shapes and patterns are foundational to the physical world. From the microcosm of atomic structures to the macrocosm of galaxies, Central to the idea of sacred geometry is the concept of the Fibonacci sequence and the golden ratio. Often symbolized by the spiral pattern seen in galaxies, hurricanes, and even the structure of DNA. The Fibonacci sequence, a series of numbers where each number is the sum of the two preceding ones, manifests in the natural world in surprising ways. For instance, a pattern of seeds in a sunflower follows this sequence, leading to the formation of a spiral that adheres to the golden ratio. Carlson's theory explores how this ratio, approximately 1.618, is not just a mathematical curiosity, but a fundamental characteristic of the universe. This divine proportion is found in the shells of snails, the structure of human faces, it's as though this ratio represents a cosmic blueprint for aesthetic and structural perfection. In the realm of astronomy, sacred geometry is evident in the orderly patterns of planetary orbits and the distribution of galaxies in the cosmos. The intricate dance of celestial bodies follows predictable geometric paths, 
suggesting a harmonious and orderly universe that resonates with the principles of sacred geometry. Delving deeper into Randall Carlson's sacred number theory, we encounter the mesmerizing world of ancient civilizations and their seemingly intentional alignments with cosmic phenomena. This segment explores how various ancient structures around the world are not just feats of architectural grandeur, but also sophisticated astronomical observatories, revealing a profound understanding of celestial mechanics. One of the most iconic examples is the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. According to Carlson's theory, this pyramid is not only a marvel of engineering, but also a structure deeply embedded with astronomical significance. The pyramid's sides are closely aligned to the cardinal points of the compass, and the structure's dimensions are said to be a scale model of the Earth, incorporating the sacred numbers and geometrical patterns reflective of the cosmos. This alignment and incorporation suggest that the ancient Egyptians had a profound understanding of the Earth's size and shape, and its place in the solar system. Moving to Stonehenge in England, this prehistoric monument is another exemplar of ancient cosmic alignment. The arrangement of its massive stones aligns perfectly with the solstices, indicating a deep knowledge of the solar cycle. These alignments might have been used for ceremonial purposes, agricultural planning, or as a way to mark the passage of time. The precision of these alignments baffles modern scientists, given the technological limitations of the era. Carlson also points to the ancient city of Teotihuacan in Mexico, where the layout of the city and its pyramids mirrors the positions of celestial bodies. The Pyramid of the Sun, Pyramid of the Moon, and the Temple of the Feathered Serpent form a complex that aligns with specific points in the sky, suggesting a sophisticated understanding of astronomy by the Teotihuacans. These alignments and architectural feats are not confined to a single region, but are a global phenomenon. From the Nazca Lines in Peru, vast geoglyphs in the desert which some theorize to be aligned with constellations, to the megalithic temples of Malta, whose orientations align with astronomical events, ancient structures around the world show a pattern of cosmic integration. Carlson theorizes that this widespread phenomenon indicates a universally shared understanding of astronomy among ancient civilizations. This knowledge, he suggests, might have been used not just for practical purposes like agriculture, but also for deeper spiritual or metaphysical reasons. The precise nature of these alignments and constructions implies that ancient societies had a holistic view of the Earth and the cosmos, seeing themselves as an integral part of a larger cosmic order. In the intriguing exploration of Randall Carlson's sacred number theory, we find a compelling intersection between ancient mythologies and geological evidence, particularly concerning the narrative of a great flood. This segment delves into how Carlson connects the dots between geological data and the flood myths prevalent in various cultures, suggesting a catastrophic event in Earth's history that left an indelible mark on human consciousness. Across numerous civilizations, from the Mesopotamian epic of Gilgamesh to the biblical story of Noah's Ark, there are strikingly similar tales of a massive flood that wiped out most of humanity. Carlson investigates these myths not as mere allegorical tales, but as potential historical records of actual events. He points to geological evidence of significant climatic shifts and catastrophic flooding at the end of the last ice age, around 11,600 years ago. This period, known scientifically as the Younger Dryas, is characterized by sudden cooling followed by rapid warming, which could have led to massive glacial melting and rising sea levels. Supporting this theory is the discovery of large-scale geological features that are indicative of massive flooding. For instance, the scablands in the Pacific Northwest of the United States show evidence of having been carved by massive, swift flows of water far beyond what could be caused by normal riverine processes. These features include large channels cut into the bedrock, known as coulees and giant ripple marks, which are difficult to explain without invoking catastrophic flood events. Carlson posits that such a flood could have been triggered by a variety of factors, including comet impacts that led to rapid melting of ice caps, causing a sudden and dramatic rise in sea levels. This hypothesis is bolstered by evidence of extraterrestrial impact events, such as high concentrations of iridium and nanodiamonds found in geological layers dating to the Younger Dryas period. The implications of this theory are profound. If true, it suggests that many of the great flood myths are not mere stories, but are based on real events that had a catastrophic impact on prehistoric human civilizations. This perspective also underscores the fragility of human societies in the face of dramatic environmental changes. Moreover, Carlson's exploration highlights the interconnectedness of mythology, geology, and astronomy. By linking geological evidence with ancient narratives, 
he presents a compelling case for re-examining our understanding of ancient history and the forces that have shaped the development of human civilization. The huge areas of the world that have never been looked at by archaeology at all. Or if looked at by archaeology, looked at only minimally. It's really important to understand that archaeology is often driven by accidental finds. Ancient structures with astronomical alignments fascinate historians, archaeologists and astronomers alike as they offer a glimpse into the sophisticated understanding of celestial movements by ancient civilizations. These structures, often monumental, not only served religious or cultural purposes but also acted as precise astronomical observatories, so we think. We think it makes more sense, take the geology, take the astronomy, this monument has its origins 12,000 years ago. The majestic pyramids of Giza have stood on the Giza Plateau, near Cairo, Egypt, for millennia, captivating us not just with their monumental architecture, but also with the mysteries of their celestial alignments. These ancient marvels, which include the towering Great Pyramid of Khufu, the Pyramid of Khafre, and the smaller Pyramid of Menkora, along with the enigmatic Great Sphinx and several smaller Queen's Pyramids, represent a pinnacle of ancient engineering and astronomical precision. And that astronomical connection to the stars at that time says to me, we cannot divorce the ancient Egyptians from the Great Pyramid. It's fascinating to think that the Great Pyramid, with its original height of 146.6 meters, held the title of the tallest man-made structure for over 3,800 years, constructed from an estimated 2.3 million blocks of stone. What really piques curiosity is the precision with which these pyramids are aligned to the cardinal points of the compass. The Great Pyramid's slight deviation from true north by just 3 60th of a degree is a testament to the ancient Egyptians' advanced knowledge of astronomy. They achieved this using the stars, particularly the circumpolar stars, which they deemed imperishable. Even more intriguing is the Orion correlation theory, which suggests the pyramid's layout mirrors the stars in Orion's belt. This celestial mapping not only connects the earthly to the divine, but also underscores the pharaoh's intended journey to join the gods in the afterlife. The ancient Egyptians' belief in an afterlife where the pharaoh, as a deity, would join the sun god Ra in his daily journey across the sky and through the underworld at night is reflected in the orientation and text of the pyramids. These were not merely tombs, but served as stairways to heaven, ensuring the pharaoh's soul could ascend to the stars. The alignment with Orion's belt, associated with Osiris, the god of the afterlife, rebirth and rejuvenation, further cements the pyramid's role in this divine narrative. That, that is who Osiris is. His image is seen in the sky as the constellation of, of Orion. Drawing a parallel, the ancient Mesoamerican city of Teotihuacan showcases similar astronomical knowledge and architectural grandeur. The main structures at Teotihuacan, notably the Pyramid of the Sun, the Pyramid of the Moon and the Temple of the Feathered Serpent also reflect celestial bodies, echoing the pyramids of Giza's connection with the cosmos. This shared inclination towards understanding and integrating celestial phenomena into architecture highlights a universal human desire to connect with the universe, a theme that transcends time, culture and geography. The stories these ancient structures tell of humanity's quest to understand the cosmos and our place within it continue to fascinate and inspire. Through their enduring legacy, the pyramids of Giza showcase the ancient Egyptians' remarkable achievements in architecture and astronomy. Continuing our journey through ancient marvels that blend architectural genius with celestial precision, let's turn our gaze to Chichen Itza. This UNESCO World Heritage Site in the Yucatan Peninsula is a dazzling testament to the Maya Toltec civilization flourishing from the 7th to the 10th century AD. Among its many wonders, the Temple of Kukulkan, or El Castillo, stands out as a symbol of the Mayans' advanced understanding of astronomy and their calendar system. El Castillo is not just any pyramid, it's a four-sided structure with 91 steps on each side and one additional step at the top, totaling 365 steps. This clever design mirrors the solar year, encapsulating the Mayas' profound connection with time itself. But the marvels don't stop there. During the equinoxes, a play of light and shadow creates the illusion of a serpent slithering down the pyramid, culminating in a stone sculpture of a serpent's head at the base. This phenomenon draws crowds from around the world, eager to witness the ancient Maya's ability to encode astronomical events into their architecture. 
The descent of this serpent symbolizes the return of Kukulkan, a deity associated with fertility and agriculture. This event likely signaled critical times for planting or harvesting, weaving the cosmos directly into the fabric of daily life and spiritual belief. But the pyramid's mysteries include auditory wonders as well. Claps at the base echo in a way that mimics the sacred Quetzal bird's chirp, perhaps intended to evoke the voice of Kukulkan during rituals. Looking beyond Chichen Itza, we find parallels in the ancient world that resonate with its astronomical sophistication. Machu Picchu, perched high in the Peruvian Andes, shares this celestial alignment, though it reflects the Incan mastery over the landscape and the heavens. Here, structures align with solstices, and the Intihuatana stone serves as an astronomical clock, much like El Castillo's alignments mark the equinoxes. Both Chichen Itza and Machu Picchu stand as testaments to their civilization's astronomical knowledge and architectural prowess. They remind us of the universal human desire to understand and integrate the cosmos into our lives, a theme as old as civilization itself. Through their enduring legacy, these ancient sites continue to captivate and inspire, offering glimpses into a time when the sky was a map, a clock, and a canvas to align our creations with the stars. Diving deeper into our exploration of ancient sites that masterfully intertwine architecture with celestial phenomena, let's venture to the Emerald Isle, where Newgrange stands as a preeminent beacon of prehistoric culture. This Neolithic marvel predating Stonehenge and the pyramids of Egypt was constructed around 3200 BC. Its architectural and astronomical precision speaks volumes about the ingenuity of its creators, revealing a sophisticated understanding of the cosmos that challenges our perceptions of ancient societies. At the heart of Newgrange is a massive circular mound sprawling across about an acre with a diameter of approximately 85 meters and a height of 13.5 meters. This structure houses a long passage stretching about 19 meters into the mound, leading to a cruciform chamber. The chamber's corbelled roof, still waterproof after millennia, stands as a testament to the remarkable skill of its builders. Yet the true genius of Newgrange lies in its astronomical alignment. Each year during the winter solstice, sunlight streams through the roof box above the entrance, bathing the inner chamber in light for about 17 minutes. This stunning phenomenon underscores a profound connection with the solar calendar, illuminating the builder's deep astronomical knowledge. The purpose and symbolism behind Newgrange's alignment with the winter solstice have been subjects of fascination. Many believe it symbolized the rebirth of the sun, marking a period of renewal and rejuvenation. This alignment may have also represented a time when the veil between the living and the dead was at its thinnest, facilitating communication with the ancestors or deities. The discovery of human bones and grave goods within suggests that Newgrange served as a sacred space for burial or ancestor worship, playing a significant role in ceremonies related to life, death, and the cycles of nature. Drawing an intriguing parallel, let's consider Gobekli Tepe in present-day Turkey, a site that predates Newgrange by several millennia. It's going to require us to reconsider uh, our whole dating sequence on megalithic sites. Known as the world's oldest temple complex, Gobekli Tepe's massive stone pillars arranged in circles and adorned with intricate carvings suggest an early form of star worship or an attempt to mark significant celestial events. Despite the vast differences in age and cultural background, both Newgrange and Gobekli Tepe exhibit advanced architectural techniques and a keen understanding of astronomical phenomena. Their construction not only served practical or ritualistic purposes, but also symbolized a deeper connection between the earthly realm and the cosmos. The spiritual and ceremonial significance of both sites likely made them focal points for gatherings and rituals, marking them as places where the community could engage with the divine. These ancient structures, through their enduring presence and the mysteries they hold, continue to draw us in, offering a window into the minds of those who built them and a reminder of humanity's eternal fascination with the stars and the natural cycles that govern life on Earth. Nobody actually knew that it existed until it was accidentally discovered. It's about 5,000 years old, but we can't read that script. The script exists, but we can't read it. So there could be all kinds of information in that script. Discoveries of ancient texts in Egypt have significantly expanded our understanding of ancient civilizations, particularly those of ancient Egypt, Greece and Rome. 
These discoveries span various genres, including religious, scientific, literary, and philosophical texts opening our eyes to ancient moments you had to be there to believe. In 1799, during Napoleon's ambitious campaign in Egypt, a remarkable discovery was made by French soldiers near the town of Rosetta, now known as Rashid. They unearthed a granodiorite slab, dark and hard, which would come to be recognized as one of the most significant archaeological finds in history, the Rosetta Stone. This discovery was monumental not just for its immediate impact, but for the doors it would open in the field of Egyptology. The Rosetta Stone, dating back to 196 BC, bears a decree issued in Memphis in honor of King Ptolemy V. What makes the stone extraordinary is its trilingual inscription. The same message is conveyed in hieroglyphics, the script used for religious documents. Demotic, the common script of Egypt, and Ancient Greek, the language of the ruling administration at the time. This feature of the Rosetta Stone provided the crucial breakthrough in deciphering Egyptian hieroglyphs, which had been a long-standing mystery. Jean-Francois Champollion, a French scholar, made the groundbreaking realization in 1822 that by comparing the Greek text, which was already understood with the hieroglyphic and demotic texts, he could unlock the ancient Egyptian language. The text inscribed on the Rosetta Stone is essentially a piece of propaganda, extolling the virtues of Ptolemy V's reign. It commands that the decree be displayed in temples across Egypt, highlighting the practice of disseminating such declarations in prominent religious and public spaces. This aspect of the Rosetta Stone reveals much about the political and religious workings of Ptolemaic Egypt, illustrating how rulers use such inscriptions to communicate with and influence their subjects. Today, the Rosetta Stone is often heralded as the world's most famous slab of stone, a symbol of the key to unlocking the mysteries of ancient Egypt. The Egyptian Book of the Dead, dating back to around 1550 to 50 BC, offers an extraordinary glimpse into the spiritual life of ancient Egypt. Unlike what its name might suggest, the Book of the Dead is not a singular book but a collection of spells, prayers, magical formulas and incantations, meticulously crafted to guide the deceased through the underworld, known as Duat, and into the afterlife. These texts, written on papyrus, were often included in the burial chambers, personalized for each individual, with spells selected for their perceived usefulness in navigating the afterlife. The evolution of these funerary texts, from the pyramid texts intended for royalty to the coffin texts and eventually to the Book of the Dead, accessible to the wider population, marks a significant shift in ancient Egyptian religious and social practices. This transition indicates a democratization of the afterlife, suggesting changes in societal structures and religious beliefs where eternal life was no longer a privilege of the pharaohs but a possibility for all. The spells within the Book of the Dead paint a vivid picture of the ancient Egyptians' beliefs regarding the afterlife, including the trials the deceased would face, such as the judgment before Osiris, the god of the afterlife. This collection of texts is invaluable for understanding ancient Egyptian religion, mythology, and views on life after death, portraying a complex belief system where the dead could continue to interact with the living and the gods. When juxtaposed with the Rosetta Stone, the Book of the Dead offers a different kind of bridge to the ancient past. The Rosetta Stone, discovered in 1799 and instrumental in deciphering Egyptian hieroglyphs, unlocked the ability to read countless texts from ancient Egypt, thus opening up a broader understanding of Egyptian civilization. In contrast, the Book of the Dead delves into the spiritual and religious beliefs of the ancient Egyptians, offering insights into their perceptions of death, the afterlife, and divinity. Though the Rosetta Stone and the Book of the Dead differ significantly, one being a bilingual decree and the other a compilation of funerary texts, they collectively illuminate the complexity of ancient Egyptian civilization. The Rosetta Stone reveals the administrative and political landscape, while the Book of the Dead provides a profound understanding of the spiritual and religious depth of this ancient culture. Diving into the intellectual and spiritual depths of ancient Egyptian civilization, two cornerstone documents stand out for their profound contributions. The Pyramid Texts and the Rhind Mathematical Papyrus, each in its own domain showcases the advanced understanding and the multifaceted nature of Egyptian life, spanning the realms of religion and mathematics. The Pyramid Texts, dating back to around 2400 to 2300 BC, hold the distinction of being the world's oldest religious texts. Inscribed within the pyramids, viewed by the ancient Egyptians not merely as tombs but as portals to the afterlife, these texts served a crucial purpose. They were intended to secure the pharaoh's divine status after death. 
offering guidance through the underworld to achieve eternal life among the gods. With over 700 spells, the pyramid texts laid the foundation for future Egyptian funerary practices as seen in the evolution of the coffin texts and the Book of the Dead. Initially reserved for pharaohs, the democratization of these texts over time reflects a significant shift, suggesting an evolving conception of the afterlife that eventually embraced all Egyptians, not just the elite. In contrast, the Rhind Mathematical Papyrus from around 1550 BC delves into the pragmatic and analytical world of mathematics. Named after Alexander Henry Rind, who acquired it in 1858, this document served an educational purpose. It trained scribes in arithmetic, algebra, and geometry, encompassing practical problems relevant to surveying, architecture, and resource distribution. This papyrus not only demonstrates the Egyptians' prowess in fractions and linear equations, but also hints at their early approximation of pi, underscoring the practical implications of their mathematical knowledge in daily life and state administration. While the pyramid texts are steeped in the spiritual and esoteric, aimed at guiding the deceased through the afterlife, the Rhind Mathematical Papyrus is grounded in the practical and worldly, focusing on mathematical education for administrative efficiency. Yet both documents illuminate the sophistication of ancient Egyptian society from different angles. The pyramid texts reflect the deep religious beliefs and funerary customs that shaped Egyptians' views on life, death and the hereafter. Meanwhile, the Rhine Papyrus reveals the pragmatic application of mathematical principles in managing the state's affairs, from architecture to the distribution of resources, highlighting the integral role of mathematics in the governance and organization of ancient Egypt. Together, the pyramid texts and the Rhine Mathematical Papyrus underscore ancient Egypt's remarkable advancements in understanding both the divine and the empirical. In 1945, near the Egyptian town of Nag Hammadi, a discovery was made that would significantly widen the lens through which we view early Christian thought. A local farmer named Muhammad al-Saman unearthed a sealed jar containing a collection of texts that shed light on the Gnostic beliefs flourishing in the 3rd and 4th centuries AD. Written in Coptic, these texts were hidden away, likely by a community that held them dear at odds with the mainstream Christian authorities of their time. The Nag Hammadi Library is a fascinating compilation ranging from gospels and philosophical treatises to revelations. It dives into deep theological debates and spiritual practices that stood apart from the orthodox teachings of the early church, emphasizing a personal connection and knowledge of the divine, known as Gnosis. Among its treasures is the Gospel of Thomas, notable for its 114 sayings of Jesus. This text in particular contains parallels to the canonical gospels, but also introduces teachings that were not included in the Bible as we know it offering new perspectives on Jesus' words and teachings. The discovery of these texts has challenged traditional narratives of early Christian history, unveiling the rich tapestry of beliefs that existed alongside what would become Orthodox Christianity. The Nag Hammadi texts paint a picture of a vibrant, albeit contested, religious landscape where various groups and sects struggled for spiritual authority and legitimacy. The act of burying these texts might have been a desperate measure by a community under threat aiming to preserve their spiritual heritage against the dominating force of Orthodox Christianity. When compared to the canonical New Testament, the Nag Hammadi texts stand out for several reasons. They bring to light the theological diversity that characterized early Christianity, offering views on mysticism, the cosmos, and the nature of divinity that diverge significantly from the Orthodox path. For instance, their portrayal of Jesus often contrasts with that of the canonical Gospels, presenting him more as a spiritual entity and questioning the physical aspects of his crucifixion and resurrection. Additionally, while the canonical Gospels derive their authority from their apostolic origins, the texts from Nag Hammadi often claim apostolic or even divine authorship as a means to assert their legitimacy and authority. The ancient underwater city of Alexandria, located at the mouth of the Nile River in Egypt, is a treasure trove of archaeological wonders and historical insights. Founded by Alexander the Great in 331 BCE, it quickly rose to become the cultural and economic hub of the ancient world. However, parts of this legendary city succumbed to the sea due to earthquakes and tsunamis over centuries. Diving into the depths of the Mediterranean, Frank Godio and his team's exploration of Alexandria's underwater ruins stands as a testament to human curiosity and technological prowess. 
The discovery of this ancient city submerged beneath the sea intertwines the grand narratives of history, technology, and myth, offering a window into one of antiquity's greatest civilizations. The use of state-of-the-art technology, including submersible robots and sophisticated sonar mapping, marks a significant evolution in underwater archaeology, reminiscent of the groundbreaking exploration of the Titanic wreck. Yet, while the Titanic's discovery opened the deep sea to archaeologists, Godio's project breathed life back into ancient urban landscapes, showcasing the advancements in archaeological methods. The preservation of artifacts and structures found underwater presents unique challenges, starkly contrasting with those encountered in the preservation of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The saltwater environment of Alexandria erodes materials over time, demanding innovative solutions for conservation, highlighting the diverse challenges archaeologists face based on the context of their discoveries. The uncovering of the royal quarters and temples in Alexandria offers unparalleled insights into the Ptolemaic dynasty's architectural and cultural grandeur, drawing comparisons to the discovery of Pompeii. However, Alexandria reveals its secrets from beneath the waves, providing a unique lens through which to view ancient urban planning and religious practices. When compared to other ancient submerged cities like Baie or Pavlopetri, Alexandria's ruins underscore the city's cosmopolitan nature, standing as a testament to its role as a center of commerce, culture, and knowledge. Alexandria's position as a cultural and economic hub in the ancient world is further emphasized by the diversity of artifacts found, echoing the melting pot of cultures found in Silk Road cities like Samarkand. The discovery of remnants believed to be part of the Pharos Lighthouse, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, underscores Alexandria's advanced engineering and pivotal role in ancient navigation, much like the Great Wall of China's significance in its own civilization. The successful exploration of Alexandria's underwater ruins not only advances our understanding of ancient civilizations, but also inspires further technological innovation in underwater archaeology. This quest to uncover the past mirrors how the space race propelled aerospace technology, demonstrating the impact of historical exploration on modern advancement. Moreover, the cultural resonance of these discoveries, akin to the fascination sparked by the discovery of King Tutankhamun's tomb, highlights the enduring allure of Egypt's ancient civilizations. Exhibitions of artifacts from Alexandria's underwater ruins have captured the global public imagination. Delving into the depths of the Mediterranean, the underwater excavations of Alexandria have unveiled treasures that paint a vivid picture of a city steeped in glory and history. Among the ruins and relics, a myriad of statues, sphinxes and architectural marvels whisper tales of ancient Alexandria's cultural and artistic zenith. One of the most breathtaking discoveries is a giant statue believed to depict Ptolemy II, an emblem of the fusion between Hellenistic and Egyptian influences that characterize the Ptolemaic dynasty. Crafted from red granite, this colossal figure stands as a bridge between two worlds, reminiscent of the Grand Colossi of Memnon in Luxor, Egypt, and underscoring the tradition of monumental sculpture that flourished in ancient Egyptian culture. The seabed also revealed sphinxes and statues of Egyptian gods and goddesses. These findings not only highlight the Ptolemies' efforts to weave together their Greek heritage with the rich tapestry of Egyptian religious symbolism. The sphinxes, majestic with their lion bodies and human heads, serve as symbols of the ruler's wisdom and power, reflecting the broader narrative of Greek and Egyptian cultural intermingling. Furthermore, the recovery of architectural fragments from Alexandria's waters provides a window into the city's architectural prowess and urban planning. Columns, capitals and friezes bear witness to a city where Egyptian, Greek and Roman influences converged, creating a unique aesthetic that mirrored Alexandria's identity as a melting pot of civilizations. This aspect of the discoveries draws parallels with the archaeological finds in ancient Rome, where a similar amalgamation of architectural styles speaks to a rich, interconnected Mediterranean world. The excavation also brought to light an assortment of pottery and jewellery, offering glimpses into the daily lives, trade and artistic expressions of Alexandria's denizens. The variety of pottery, from utilitarian domestic vessels to elaborately decorated ceremonial pieces, suggests a society of complex social strata and diverse needs. Meanwhile, the jewellery, Gold earrings, necklaces and rings, often embellished with precious stones, underscores Alexandria's affluence and its pivotal role in the trade networks that crisscrossed the Mediterranean. 
These artifacts not only reveal the city's artistic flair, but also its connections to a wider world. Through these discoveries, the underwater ruins of Alexandria continue to fascinate and enlighten, offering a mosaic of insights into one of antiquity's most magnificent cities. When divers stumbled upon a shipwreck near the Greek island of Antikythera in 1901, little did they know they were about to uncover one of the most astonishing artifacts of the ancient world, the Antikythera mechanism. Often hailed as the world's first analog computer, this device dating back to around 100 BCE is a marvel of ancient engineering and scientific knowledge. With its intricate system of over 30 bronze gears housed in a wooden frame, the mechanism was designed to predict lunar and solar eclipses, track the cycles of the Olympic Games, and model the moon's complex orbit, showcasing a level of technological sophistication that seems centuries ahead of its time. But what's truly fascinating about the Antikythera mechanism isn't just its complexity and precision. It also served as an astronomical and calendar device, capable of calculating the positions of the sun, moon, and perhaps even the planets. It featured dials for the zodiac and solar calendar, embedding celestial phenomena within the fabric of timekeeping in ancient Greek society. Inscriptions on the device acted as a user guide, revealing a profound understanding of astronomy and mathematics among its creators and users. While the origins of this extraordinary artifact remain speculative, many believe its connection to Alexandria isn't far-fetched. Known as the intellectual beacon of the Hellenistic world, Alexandria was home to the legendary library and the museum, a research institution that attracted scholars like Euclid, Hero and Archimedes. Their contributions to mathematics, physics and engineering could very well have influenced the creation of the Antikythera mechanism, suggesting it may have originated from this vibrant scientific community. In fact, some scholars posit that the principles behind the mechanism could have been inspired by Archimedes himself. Although he lived earlier than the device's estimated creation date, the discovery of the Antikythera mechanism in a shipwreck hints at the extensive trade networks and cultural exchanges of the time linking Alexandria with other Greek locales, including Antikythera. Such connections likely facilitated the spread of technological and scientific knowledge across the Mediterranean. The legacy of the Antikythera mechanism extends far beyond its historical and archaeological significance. It stands as a testament to the technological achievements of the ancient Greeks, challenging our perceptions of ancient technology and highlighting their sophisticated understanding of mechanical devices. Modern scientists and engineers have drawn inspiration from this ancient marvel, leading to new discoveries about ancient science and technology, and even the development of replicas using ancient techniques. Ongoing research, employing advanced imaging techniques, continues to unveil the secrets of the Antikythera mechanism, offering insights not just into the device itself, but also into the scientific and cultural milieu of the Hellenistic period. Through the lens of this remarkable artifact, we gain a deeper appreciation for the ingenuity of the ancient world, particularly the pivotal role played by Alexandria in fostering a legacy of innovation and knowledge that continues to inspire to this day.